I got a fever. And the only prescription is more cowbell. <laughs> How do we define good music? Everyone has their own strong opinions about it. After all, music taste is so subjective that it almost feels unfair to try to pin it down. For me, I like to look at songs that stick in the public sphere. Does a song have staying power? Are people still listening years or decades after its release? Beyond that, does it have influence in the culture? Is it in TV shows or movies? Are there additional art, media, or comedy pieces that feature it prominently? And do those art forms themselves have influence? For the song we'll be talking about today, the answer is a resounding and unequivocal yes. So much so, in fact, that I recently had a 10-year-old guitar student beg me to learn it for his most recent recital, despite the fact that it came out 38 years before he was born. And his request takes on some additional weight when you consider that he asked me to accompany him during the recital on the cowbell. Let's talk about it. What's up guys, my name is Connor and today we're going to be talking about the song Don't Fear the Reaper by the band Blue Oyster Cult. Before we get into it, if you like this video, please click the like button down below, leave a comment, and subscribe to this channel. Your support goes a tremendously long way. Today we'll not only be breaking down the songwriting aspects of the song and talking about what makes it tick and why it works, but we'll also be examining how this song helped revolutionize musical comedy. So stick around till the end of this video for the full story. So who is Blue Oyster Cult? Blue Oyster Cult is a hard rock band from Long Island, New York that was popular for much of the 70s. They formed in 19 1967 with the original name Soft White Underbelly, derived from Winston Churchill's description of Italy and its relatively weak role as an Axis power in World War II. The band started from a small contingent of students at Stony Brook University on Long Island. Sandy Perlman, one of the first rock music critics, sat in on his friend Don Roser's jam session with Albert Bouchard. Through Perlman's initiative, Roser, who played guitar, and Bouchard, who played drums, decided to form a full band. Sandy Perlman's role in the band was interesting. He was not technically a band member because he didn't sing or play any instruments, but he sort of functioned like a band member. He wrote a lot of poetry, and a good chunk of the band's lyrics throughout their entire tenure as a band came directly from Perlman's writings. Sandy was our primary lyricist for, for a lot of our career, very much involved in what the band was. He also acted as a producer, listed as one of the primary producers along with his partner Mary Krugman on every single one of the first five Blue Oyster Cult albums. By the time Don't Fear the Reaper was recorded in 1975, the band consisted of Don Roser on guitar, who by that time had adopted the stage name Buck Dharma, once again, courtesy of Sandy Perlman. Eric Bloom on vocals. Alan Lanier on keys. Albert Bouchard on drums, percussion, and... Maybe Cowbell? We'll talk more about that later. And Joe Bouchard, Albert's brother, on bass. On this track in particular, Roser wrote the entire song and sang all of the lead vocals. David Lucas, Sandy Perlman, and Murray Kriegman were the producers of the track, and the track was engineered and mixed by Shelley Yakis. Roser jokingly described the process of working with three producers as pandemonium, but apparently they were all able to work together in harmony, with Lucas supplying more of the musical touch, and Perlman and Krugman providing the overall vision, and as Roser called it, the vibes. Don Roser, who wrote the song, has said that it's about transcendent love, you know, that's more powerful than this mortal, uh, present, alive thing that we're all going through. It's a love song. It's about a guy who passes away and leaves his lover behind. When it's his lover's time to go, he comes back and speaks to her, telling her not to fear what's coming, that they'll be reunited for eternity, and that she can let go of all of her fears about death in the afterlife. At face value, it might seem kind of dark and grim, but it's actually a very sweet sentiment. Depending on how you feel about the afterlife, it can present kind of a hopeful message. Don Roser said he wrote the song after he was diagnosed with a heart condition, an experience which presented his mortality to him in stark detail. People often misjudge the song and think of it as a song about suicide, primarily because of one of the lines in the song, Romeo and Juliet together in eternity. For those who don't know, in Romeo and Juliet, the story ends with the pair both committing suicide because they can't be together. This mischaracterization plagued Roser throughout his life, and he's lamented the fact that the Romeo and Juliet line was just supposed to be an example of eternal love that transcended death. Throughout the song, there's this begging, almost imploring quality to the lyrics. You have lines like, We can be like they are. Come on, baby, don't fear the reaper, baby, take my hand. Those lines kind of overlap and intertwine with each other and create this sense of desperation and urgency. But the airy, distant quality of Roser's vocals give it this sort of ethereal and mystical tinge. And the combination of those two things makes the song feel just 
haunting, and in the best way possible, kind of unsettling. There's a bit of a spiritual or philosophical tinge to it as well. And peppered in are elements of what seems to be the Buddhist non-attachment philosophy. Roser includes lines such as, Seasons don't fear the reaper, nor do the wind, the sun, or the rain, we can be like they are. Which is the protagonist imploring his lover to let go of her attachments to mortal life, so that she can freely join him in the afterlife. Roser incorporates a couple other lyrical techniques that are kind of fascinating as well. He's said that people often kind of poke him about the line 40,000 men and women every day, a reference to approximately how many people every day are dying. At the time he wrote the song, the number was closer to 135,000. And he's had pedantic purists getting on his case about it for decades. However, 40,000 men and women every day is already a lot of syllables to include in one line, especially when you consider the fact that that line is repeated and overlapped with itself again and again. Yeah, no, it's, it had to sing well. It had to fit in the, the cadence of the, of the music. This is an artistic choice that he made so that the lyrics fit the meter a little better. It's already a lot, and trying to go, 135,000 men and women every day, 135 men and women. <laughs> can't even do it. You see the point though, it's way too much. And aside from the rare percentage of the population that knows death statistics like the back of their hand, the 40,000 men and women every day line presents the vivid statement that he's trying to make in a way that resonates and is memorable, even if it's not entirely accurate. So then you get to the third verse and you find out that this song isn't just some random appearance of this woman's former lover trying to come and selfishly yank her from the earth into death. You instead find out that she's already on the verge of death herself. You have the line, came the last night of sadness and it was clear she could go on. I love the choice to save this line for the third verse because it adds additional context to the song that you didn't have at the start. It creates more of a story arc. Once this line is presented, you get the sense that he's trying to lovingly and gracefully guide her into the afterlife, help supplant her fears with excitement and promise. There's still a selfish, all-consuming love angle, although maybe selfish isn't the right word. I feel like that kind of detracts away from the purity of the love. But the point is it's the urgency of the lyrics that makes that come through. Clearly the narrator or protagonist of the song deeply loves this person and is sort of impatient and excited for her to join him in the afterlife. But those two lyrical elements, the selfish all-consuming love and the benevolent death doula arc, combine together and cause the lyrics to present as a complex cavalcade of emotions. In the lyrics there's a little bit of paranormal imagery as well that helps add to the mystique. When it's the subject's time to go, you get lines like, then the door was opened and the wind appeared, the candles blew and then disappeared, the curtains blew and then he appeared. First of all, the repetition of appeared, you have appeared, disappeared, appeared, is really captivating. You also have the symmetry of the lines. The door was open, the candles blew, the curtains drew. They're constructed in a really elegant way. But they create this very vivid metaphysical construction of what it might look or feel like to depart the world when it's your time to go. So once Roser had finished writing the song, he recorded the entire thing himself as a demo on a multi-track and brought it to the band. During the actual recording, he handled all of the lead vocals, which was kind of interesting considering the band had a lead vocalist in the form of Eric Bloom. Actually, something that's even more fascinating is that on this album, Agents of Fortune, Every single one of the five band members contributed lead vocals to at least one song. It's not a super common thing for a band to do unless they're an acapella group or a boy band. The track was recorded with primarily basic rock music instrumentation. You have a rhythm guitar that holds down a main riff for the bulk of the song. That main riff was actually layered with a little bit of clavinet, and if you listen really closely to the first five seconds of the song, you can hear the clavinet come in the second time through the riff. There's quite a few guitar layers throughout the song. A lot of the empty spaces between the vocals and the song are punctuated by Roser's reverb-soaked lead guitar lines. And then, of course, as is tradition with 70s rock music, you have a guitar solo about two-thirds of the way through the song. We'll talk about that here in a bit. The song also included, of course, drums, bass, keyboards, which were provided both by Alan Lanier and David Lucas. There's also some horns on the song, believe it or not, provided by Randy and Michael Brecker. They're only really in the bridge, and they're kind of buried and layered with everything else. But if you listen closely, they're there. And then, of course, there's the cowbell, played by, well... We don't really know. Albert Bouchard swears he played it. So I play it and I'm like, nah, it's not working. And he's like, oh, well, put some tape around it. So I put some tape around it. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Eric Bloom says to his memory, he's the one that played it. And to my memory, I played it. And apparently David Lucas thinks he's the one who played it. Uh, David Lucas swears he played it. So uh, I will defer to him. But the one thing everybody can agree on is that it was David Lucas's idea to try it out. Now, the actual form of the song is odd. It's a little unconventional. I'm gonna try my best to break it down, and I've labeled the sections as well as I can. But considering the extent to which it defies conventional song form, it's kind of hard to do. So the song starts with the lead riff being played on an electric guitar. The riff follows a six, five, four, 
five chord progression in the key of C. The way it's played though, the four chord comes off more as a four, six, nine chord. <laughs> which is a really pretty chord that induces a sense of longing that fits perfectly with the lyrical content of the song. You have a first verse and then it transitions into this mishmash section that I don't know whether to call a pre-chorus or chorus or some combination of both, but you have two sections that seamlessly blend into each other in a way that they can't really be separated. You have the first section, Seasons don't fear the reaper, nor do the wind, the sun, or the rain. We can be like they are. And by the end of the we can be like they are line, you're kind of into a separate second section. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to call this entire thing the chorus. Following this, we go into sort of a post-chorus interlude section that emulates the verse melody, but with no lyrics. La, 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 la. There's a hard stop, a little bit of a break. Then the intro kick starts again, and we go into verse two. All the way through the second verse, and then the second chorus mishmash section thing all the way through into another interlude with the la 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 la's another hard stop and then you're at the bridge the bridge is super cool we very abruptly transition into a new key with no warning suddenly we're in the key of a flat or f minor the bridge is introduced with a single guitar part that just consists of ascending arpeggios first an f minor chord arpeggio and then a g dominant seven arpeggio but without the fifth this progression in the key of A-flat functions as a 6 to a 7 dominant progression, which sounds super eerie, mostly because of that 7 dominant chord. Here it is played over the root of the key, A-flat. And here it is played over the 6 of the key, F. Once the new key and chord progression is established, the solo comes in, and Don Roser just goes off. He's spoken openly in interviews about how he just improvised the solo, and the one they used was the very first take, which speaks to his prowess as a guitarist. The solo lines have a lot of what feels like Middle Eastern influence, particularly because of the sharp four. The sharp four, which is D, fits really nicely into the G7 chord, and it helps contribute to the sort of haunting, mystical atmosphere. The solo is very rhythmic as well and features a lot of tremolo picking, which is where you pluck a single note really, really fast over and over again. You get to the end of the solo, and Roser holds out a long, sustained G note as the final note, which is nice because it acts as a bridge between the key of A-flat, where it matches the 7 dominant chord, and then the key of C, where it acts as the 5, which is a very common scale degree. The arpeggios in the key of A-flat slowly fade out while he's holding this note, and the main riff slowly sneaks back in, and it's actually impressive how seamlessly that transition happens. Main riff comes back in, you go to verse 3, you go to another one of those weird mishmash chorus sections, but this time it's way more extended and drawn out with many more lyrics, a lot more instrumentation and repetition, and everything's just building all the way throughout this chorus section. And then the outro is just an extension of that chorus with everything picking up steam more and more. The only thing you lose is the vocals, but they're replaced with Roser's little lead line that he used throughout the song to fill in the gaps between the vocals. That lead riff cements everything together as the music starts to fade. The drums drop off first and then the rest of the instrumentation follows and you have a very, very, very slow fade all the way through to the end of the song. Now as far as the vocal melody goes in the song, it's very simple. The verse melody is just a descending major scale, starting at the 1 and dropping down to the 5. All our times have come. And then the chorus kind of does the reverse. You have an ascending major scale going up to the 1. Nor do the wind, the sun, or the rain, we can be like they are. Simple, but effective and super memorable. So all these elements come together to create this masterful track that immediately became a huge hit and launched Blue Oyster Cold into the limelight. The track climbed up to number 12 on the Billboard charts, but that doesn't even begin to tell the full story of its influence. The song's been featured in countless movies and TV shows. Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of Halloween, Zombieland, Scrubs, Miracle, Gone Girl, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, and countless others. I can go on and on and on. It even served as a primary inspiration for Stephen King for his novel The Stand, where funnily enough he misheard the lyrics and thought it was come on Mary instead of come on baby, actually quoting the line incorrectly in the book, which is very funny to me. But perhaps nothing highlights the why ranging and inarguable influence of the song as much as its inclusion in the famed SNL skit More Cowbell. The skit aired on April 8th, 2000, primarily featuring Christopher Walken as the producer of the song and Will Ferrell as Gene Frankel, the band's esteemed cowbell player. They go into the studio to record and after a few moments of performing, Walken comes out of the booth and says to the band, look, what you guys are doing is great, this is gold, but we need more cowbell. We gotta have more cowbell. I'm telling you, fellas, 
You're gonna want that cowbell! The next take, Pharaoh really amps up his cowbell playing. His shirt starts riding up over his belly, his hips start swinging in full force, and it's a hilarious visual. Again and again, Walken comes out and tells the band, what you guys are doing is awesome, but we gotta have more cowbell. He even delivers maybe the most memorable line in SNL history. I got a fever! And the only prescription is more cowbell! The skit took the world by storm. The absurdity of placing so much emphasis on cowbell, along with Walken's intensity and Farrell's antics, made it instantly memorable. The sketch was only made possible due to the weird prominence of the cowbell in the track, which, funnily enough, wasn't even really real. According to Sandy Perlman, <laughs> And the cowbell is not particularly loud on the actual mix. Uh, the radio compressors bring the cowbell to the forefront. This sketch turned into maybe the most popular sketch in SNL history. It was ranked the number one SNL sketch by both Screen Ranked and Hot New Hip Hop. And Entertainment Weekly ranked it easily the number one sketch of the 1999-2000 season. To this day, you still have people of all ages, including my 10-year-old guitar student, who have seen the skit, know it well, and reference the lines. Its popularity was wide-reaching, all-consuming, and complete completely inarguable. To me, it's just fascinating how you can have a song that's so serious and so intense and emotional and make it the centerpiece of a sketch that's just purely comedic, silly, goofy, and fun. So there you go. There's Don't Fear the Reaper in a nutshell. What do you think? Is the song as influential as I say it is, or am I missing the mark? Let me know in the comments below, and also let me know if there's a song you'd like me to break down. Thank you guys for watching this video through to the end. I appreciate you all. Don't forget to subscribe, and that's all she wrote. I'll see you in the next one.